please open your Bibles to Psalm 145. Psalm 145 is a psalm of David. It is the last psalm of David. It is considered the last will and testament by some of David. It is the last word that he speaks in the Bible. It is also an acrostic psalm. An acrostic is where each Sentence or stanza begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Psalm 119, the longest psalm. Each stanza begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. This psalm has 21 verses, so for some reason they left out the nun or the n letter for this and only used 21. But it still is an acrostic psalm, and it is the last acrostic psalm in the Bible. The remaining psalms are all uh, unknown author and all praise related. And so this kind of kicks off the final psalms with David giving a praise psalm. He starts by saying, I will exalt, extol you, my God. And my king, bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And this is like an invocation. This is an invitation for people to come and praise God. This is an invitation for people to come and be in the presence of God. And this is kind of what we do when we sing songs. We open the service with a song. It is a call to worship. It is an invocation. If you think about God and who He is, and you think about us and who we are. God is great and mighty. God needs nothing from Him. We can give Him nothing. There are people who believe that if you give a lot of money to an organization, that that will cause God or force God to bless you, that there are things that we can do to manipulate God. That is not true. All of the events in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus of of sacrificing animals were to gain forgiveness kind of as a cause and effect the way God had set it up. But we, on this side of the cross, we do not do that because Jesus Christ died for our sins once and for all. He was the last sacrifice. And so you ponder this and you say, I really love God, I really want to do something for God. I really want to uh, be in God's good graces. I want to have a relationship with God. What do I do? And the answer throughout all of Scripture, and especially in the New Testament, the one thing we do is we praise and worship God. He does not need our praise and worship. He is not better because of it. There are Uh, myths about uh, old Roman and Greek gods that if you did not worship them, they would get weak and they would actually die, that their food was the worship of people. We do not have that relationship with God. God is not that way. We worship and we praise Him, and that is based on His relationship or His position and our position and our relationship to that position, our relationship to Uh, doing the things that uh, cause us to be good and true Christians and reflections of His will and His way. And so this psalm brings that point. This psalm, when David, he says three different levels of praise in verse 2. He says, I will praise you, and that's good. We do praise God. He says, I will praise you every day. And that is kind of a different view than is taught today. There is kind of the view that you come to church and only corporately at church can we truly praise God. But David is saying, no, you praise Him every day. You praise Him when you wake up. You praise Him as you're going through your work, as you're going through your day. We praise you forever and ever. Some people might promise things until... Death do you part. We do that in marriages, but we do not promise God anything. I will do this until I die, or I will do this until you call me home. And 
guess all the TVs broke, okay. <laughs> and so in, in this, uh, we can praise God and you can in many ways practice what you are doing today for all eternity. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, then you know that if I open the Bible and I start praising God by what I read, we know from Jesus' words that the Bible, God's word, is never going to pass away. I'm going to be doing that same thing to some degree or another in heaven. And so a lot of what we do today is a rehearsal. A lot of what we do today is a rehearsal for all eternity. And so he gets David, I guess, answering the question, what do we praise God for? What do we worship God for? And we worship him for his greatness, and that is in verses 3 through 6. It says, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend the works to another, and shall declare his mighty acts. When we think about God's mighty acts. There are two levels in Scripture about what these mighty acts are. The first is nature. Some have said that if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you live in the most beautiful part of the world, and there are wonderful things to see. You've got the bay, you've got the coast, you've got mighty sequoia redwoods, you've got mountains, you've got, you name it, you got it here, and it, the weather's good too. So you've got great things here, but you can travel throughout the world. You can see the mighty things that God has done. You can see the mighty mountain ranges. You can visit multiple oceans, and you can think, wow, you know, how did this all happen? And of course, the, the push today is to say, well, it all just happened. It all just uh, was a random event out of evolution. But if you study it and you look, we got a couple trees on the other side of our parking lot. Just go stare at the trees and how intricate they are and how beautiful the leaves are. And you think the variety of trees is huge. And all of that is just a random chance. Doesn't seem to make sense that these are works of God. And Romans 1 makes it clear, it says the heavens, but it is up there, and it is also down here, it is all of creation, declare the glory of God. And so the idea of how God put this together, it is supposed to be so intricate and interesting that people look at it and say, somebody had to make this. Okay, that is how creation is designed. But of course, you can put on blinders and you can say, I don't want to see it. But the second level, because if you just see nature, that will tell you there is a creator. He's probably creative. The fact that this earth supports life probably shows that he's interested in our life. You may get an area of love out of that or at least concern for humanity. That's about as far as it'll take you. And the second level of revelation or um, information from God, you have to go to the Bible. It is called special revelation because it is a special statement, a special story for us to get to know God. And in that story, the star of that story, the main focus of that story is Jesus Christ. I do believe that the Bible is a unified story, one story that points to Jesus Christ. And in pointing to Jesus Christ, we learn about His sacrifice and His blood. And for God so loving the world that He gave His Son, the idea that God is not just a creator of beautiful flowers and a beautiful landscapes. God loves you so much, He made a eternal way for you to be with him and to get to know him. And these are the mighty works that we can talk about. And also in the Bible, the mighty work that God repeats over and over in the Old Testament, the mighty work is the Exodus. The first part of Exodus 
God is picking Moses and God is raising Moses up to get the people out of Egypt, and he does so with ten plagues or ten mighty works. And in those mighty works, the Passover celebration came out of that, and the Jewish people were commanded to follow that precisely, and it tells you exactly how to do it in the Bible, follow the Passover precisely every year to remind you of that exodus. And there are Orthodox Jews today that as we are approaching Easter, the week before Easter this year, is actually the Passover week culminating on that Sunday that we have Easter. We do not celebrate Passover because we have Jesus Christ. We celebrate the resurrection. We do not have to um, celebrate an exodus because we are celebrating an entrance. We are celebrating our entrance into the kingdom of God and God sending his son to die and raise from the dead. Not only great, God is fantastic and wonderful and huge and great and does all these things. In the second section, 7 through 9, God is also good. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundance and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. If God was a fantastic creator, if God was, uh, you know, even made us and has a direction for us to go, but he was not good, then we can cause him to fly off the handle, for example. We can sin so much that his reaction would be to wipe us out. And of course, God knows who we are, and so if he had to wipe us out every time we'd sin, he would have a new creation every second because we are not that great in coming to, into our righteousness. And so in, these, in this passage, David uses the words gracious, compassionate twice, love, and goodness, that when we speak of God, God is good, God is loving, we can actually pray to Him and have a relationship to Him because we know that He loves us, because He is good, because He will not come against us because of our sin. There's a interlude, if you will, in verse 10. All your work shall give thanks to, the, to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. And this is kind of a a interlude that doesn't match what's before it or after it, so it's kind of a way for us to pause and just praise God and give thanks to Him and all the saints. And for us today, we are the saints. We are told by the Bible that if you are a Christian, you are a saint. You are a kingdom of priests we are, and we are saints. We are saved by God and because of that, we are saints, we are holy. We are holy in the presence of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. It then talks about the glory of God in 11 through 13. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of men your mighty needs and the glorious splendor of your kingdom your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his works and kind in all of his works. This is God gets the glory. God is in charge. And one thing that is good to do is when you see things in Scripture and you say, well, that looks familiar, like verse 13 does, and you think, well, where have I seen it before? If you have read your Bible and the people of Israel sinned, they split the kingdom, the Assyrians came in and took away the northern kingdom, the Babylonians came in and took away the southern kingdom. The king that took away the people in 
586, I think, B.C., to Babylon. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was an egomaniac. Nebuchadnezzar had a chip on his shoulder. Nebuchadnezzar, if you were to ask him, are you better than me? He would say, absolutely, yes, I'm better than you. He thought he was better than everybody else. In the book of Daniel, which was written during this 70-year period in uh, Babylon, in chapter 4, there is a story. Nebuchadnezzar is standing up on his palace, and he says, look what a great thing I built. How fantastic it is. I did all this. I am amazing. I am wonderful. And God says, oh yeah? And in Daniel 4.30... God hits him with insanity. He lived like a wild beast eating grass for seven years. The most powerful guy in the world, because he was the world leader at that time, was some say chained up, some say he was allowed to roam free, but he became like a wild beast. He had no reasoning capabilities. And God did that to him, for seven years, and you say, well, that's not very gracious, and that's not very merciful. God being gracious and God being merciful will take opportunities to train and to teach us. And you say, well, that's not a very good lesson, because I wouldn't want to be insane for seven years. But at the end of seven years, he seemed to have a memory of this. He seemed to have an understanding because he writes this letter to everybody in the world. And it says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar was quoting Psalm 145, 13. So he had some understanding. Maybe Daniel was there reading it to him. I don't know. But he had some understanding of who God was. And God gave him the understanding to quote Psalm 145, 13. And so... What is Nebuchadnezzar saying to interpret Psalm 145? Nebuchadnezzar is saying that God can and does do whatever he wants, that I can shake my fist at him only so long, and God will do something to stop me from shaking my fist. God will get his way no matter what, God will do whatever He wants to whomever He wants, whenever He wants. And whether you are an elected person or a military leader or a uh, king of some kind, people who have authority on this planet need to read the story of Nebuchadnezzar and have an understanding that they can only grab so much for themselves before God will shut them down. And what happened after this? Nebuchadnezzar gave God all the glory. He didn't blame God. He didn't lecture God. He didn't tell God he was wrong. He gave God all the glory. And so when God does things, His focus, His plan, His point in doing things like the Exodus to Babylon, like messing with Nebuchadnezzar, these things ultimately give God the glory, give God ultimate glory. And if we look at the world and we say, well, I don't like this, and this is violent, why would God allow this, and why does God do this? The answer ultimately is it gives Him the glory. And you say, but I don't see it, and that's right because you do not understand what God does to give Himself the glory. We are the servants of the Master. We give Him glory. We praise and worship Him. But how the big picture is working out even now, we cannot conceive. We cannot conceive because we are not God. 
Then you go to 14 through 20, and it's all about God being gracious, God giving things, God satisfying the desires. God is righteous in all His ways. It says in 19, He fulfills the desire of those who fear Him. I have had people come to me and say, I have prayed for a new house years and years and years and years and years and years, and and God won't give me what I want. Okay, I've had actually people come to me and say, God won't give me what I want. And they quote verses that God will give you the desires of his heart, and that's in the Bible, I think, seven times. It says it, that if you have desires of your heart, God will fulfill that. But they always forget in this passage, the second, I say, do you fear God? And they say, what? Of course not. Why would I fear God? He's a loving father. But it says he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. And if you don't have a fear of God in your mind and in your heart, then you are weakening who God is. God, at the end of time, is going to punish those who rejected Christ in a huge way. And it's called so bad, it's called the Great Tribulation. And God will give punishment and wrath to those who deserve it. And at that point in time, saved or unsaved, it's going to be a scary thing. God is powerful, and when God shows his power, it's scary. And so we love God. We love God with all our hearts, but I also fear his power. I know that because of Christ, I am not under God's wrath, But God is a fearful, powerful God that we can't even conceive of what he's going, what he can do. Read the story of Nebuchadnezzar, and that should cause us to pause of what God is going to do to bring about glory to him. But we know that he is merciful and gracious to us. He is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. I can go boldly into the throne room of of God and pray my heart out. And God will answer my prayers in His time, in His way, to His glory. And if I begin to see God as a vending machine, then I am missing the point, and I will probably not get anything from God. The passage ends then with verse 21. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. This verse is the last verse that David wrote. It is called the last will and testament by some scholars of David. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. We start by speaking the praise of the Lord, and then those of like mind will join in until everybody that is left that is in heaven will praise God forever and ever. Some people have said, well, what are you going to do in heaven? The answer is we're going to praise and worship God, and that is going to take many forms, and it's going to be an amazing, unbelievable thing for all eternity, but that is what God wants of us, and we will finally be enabled. And that whole sin nature and the sin will be removed, and we will be able to praise God fully and wholly and completely. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we do praise your name. We praise your name that this whole world is heading in one direction, and that one direction is where you show your might and your power, and you bring all who love you into heaven with you forever. Lord, I pray that you would make us a people who practices now what we will be doing in heaven. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to worship. Teach us how to give you all the adoration that you deserve. Lord, we praise you for this. And as your blessing on the day and the meal after, we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.